Hello, everyone. Welcome to Vario's virtual fireside chat, we will, where we will dive into how virtual reality is being used in higher education. My name is Kara Spadero, and I work with Vario's channel partners in North America. We're lucky enough to be hosting today's fireside chat with one of them, Adorama Business Solutions. To give a quick overview of who Vario is, we're a Finnish immersive technology company making virtual and mixed reality hardware and services with a focus specifically on enterprise customers. Our headsets are being used to do things such as train pilots, design cars, uh, conduct research experiments, and so much more. A few practicalities before we get started. You'll notice in the bottom panel of your Zoom window, there is a Q&A feature. Please make sure that you drop questions throughout the discussion. They'll be answered in either chat or we'll make sure that they're answered by our panel at the end. Now, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our panelists today. First, my colleague, Tim Collins, who is the higher ed specialist on our sales team here at Vario, and also David Weintrop, who's the director of sales for higher education with Adorama Business Solutions. Now that I've shared a little bit about Vario, I'd love to turn it over to David to talk a bit more about Adorama. Thank you, Karis. Appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be here with you all on behalf of Adorama Business Solutions and very happy to be partnering with Vario to bring you this informative session to share and explore the potential of virtual reality in the world of academia. At Adorama, we are dedicated to providing cutting edge business solutions to businesses and educational institutions alike. While many of you may already know Adorama, hopefully, uh, and our loyal customers, it's important that you know that we have a team of dedicated account managers and technical specialists who are focused solely in the higher education space. So with intros behind us, we can move on to uh, getting into the, the nitty gritty here. We're starting with some audience participation, a few questions if everyone wouldn't mind engaging us so we can get a sense uh, of who's joining us today and what level or capacity uh, you're already or hope to be engaged in with virtual reality. Each question will leave you about 45 seconds to answer, uh, and then we'll see uh, how we go. The first one, not too complicated, it's a yes or no. Uh, have your students expressed interest in using or learning more about VR? So Tim, uh, I think this one, uh, where do you typically see the interest or demand originating or stemming from? Well, hopefully this will be a lot of yeses, um, but, you know, well, of course, professors and different, you know, programs are already using VR in curriculums. Oftentimes we do see student interest really driving the conversation. Um, a lot of conversations I have with professors and researchers sometimes start because they say, hey, a student reached out and, you know, saw this technology and, and had an interest in using it for a project. So, it's really great to see sort of a, a spectrum on how, you know, these conversations start. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Maybe not all yeses, but 75% uh, it looks like. So we'll take those. We'll take that. That's pretty good. You, you weren't too far off the mark. Nicely done there. All right. So let's step up to the next question here. Uh, are you currently using VR at your college, university, or institution? A few more options here. Uh, I suspect this one, Tim, we're going to see varying degrees of uh, involvement here. Uh, would you say that most are likely to be more dipping their toe into the uh, VR pool, or what do you think? Well, if the answers on these are in the no category, I'm, I'm okay with that, because hopefully we can change some minds um, and sure. get some conversations started. But yeah, I, I would expect a pretty varied response. I mean, a lot of universities are just starting to adopt this technology. Um, and some of them have been using it for years, so it, it should be pretty spread out. So um, we've got some with VR labs, about 29%, 4% uh, in the library, about 29% as well within their departments, uh, and 20% in other departments, and 18% are no, so I, that's a broad mix. Yeah, Third, and... Yeah, just those 18, those 10 people, you know, soon, hopefully that will be a yes. <laughs> Very soon. Absolutely. Okay. So third and final question for this portion, uh, for those using VR in your academic program today, what is your focus? So what field uh, or department, obviously we see, uh, you know, art and design, uh, AEC, psychology, medical, 
business, defense, and so on and so forth. So I'll be curious to see what this one uh, pops up. Uh, who, who would you say, Tim, uh, have been the early adopters with VR and where are you seeing it more today? Well, you know, it, it's, it's pretty interesting because for us, you know, while the, the university market is, you know, not as large as maybe the work that the Department of Defense are doing, um, but it's a really interesting space because it is a microcosm of our whole customer base. Not surprised to see, you know, a lot of different answers here because we really do see every use case um, on the enterprise and, you know, commercial side being replicated at a lab somewhere in, in universities. Um, so great to see how spread out this is. Yeah, again, another one where it's a pretty broad mix, which is fantastic. So hopefully we'll touch on a lot, if not all of uh, what we're seeing here today as we continue in the conversation. So that said, uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your, your engagement in, in our polls. And um, Tim, why don't you start uh, educating the group a little bit here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to start off with some basic terms, I mean, it seems like people are familiar with this technology, at least most of the audience, but for those who are not in to do some review, um, in, in general, a, a quick, easy definition of, of VR would just be anything that is computer generated, um, a simulation of a, a three-dimensional image or an environment that you can interact with in a seemingly physical or real way. Um, the key thing here versus the other two terms is that you are completely in this virtual environment. You cannot interact with your surroundings in uh, any way. Um, then moving down to AR, AR is more of an interactive experience. Um, so you're gonna combine the real world and the computer generated content in some way. Um, and there's actually a ton of AR technology you know, around us now in, in society at large. Um, if you've ever you know, gone to do shopping on Amazon and looked at a bookshelf and pulled up your phone and, you know, can see sort of an overlay of it in the corner. You know, that's an AR-based technology. Um, David, I don't know if you were a big Pokemon Go player during the pandemic, but that was certainly one that got very popular and, and sort of familiarized the tech as well. Um, so you don't necessarily need a headset for AR, but there are other devices, of course, that, you know, uh, that achieve AR technology. And then mixed reality being on the bottom, um, very similar to AR, except the big difference is that it's more immersive and you do need a headset. Um, and really the goal of a mixed reality experience is to blend this virtual and uh, physical content to such a degree that you really can't tell the difference from the user experience side. And you sort of reached a place where um, you know, not to get too philosophical, but it's tough to distinguish what is real and, and what is fake. So from that perspective with mixed reality and, and this level of technology, is that something uh, that Vario, would you say, stands alone in the industry? Uh, or so do other brands have that as well? Yeah, on the mixed reality side, we do have the most advanced mixed reality headsets um, on the market. So it's it's an area that we've really pushed the envelope on. Um, and, you know, there are other technologies, uh, you know, that have and on the optical see-through side that have sort of made their way into um, different use cases and that people are probably familiar with. But the video see-through mixed reality that we use um, dates back a, a pretty long time. I mean, the research started at Nokia in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, and then Actually, when Microsoft purchased Nokia, they were putting some of the Vario researchers and, and execs on the team that would end up creating the HoloLens, um, which is an AR technology, uh, an optical see-through technology. And the team at Vario wanted to continue their video see-through or mixed reality research. So they actually broke off and formed Vario about five years ago. Um, so we've really been on the cutting edge and have sort of spearheaded the video see-through mixed reality technology. And a lot of companies in the space seem to be moving in that direction now. So it's good to see the you know hard years of work sort of proved out in the market. Very true, excellent. So, you know, in, in sort of, as I mentioned on the last slide, um, you know, our goal was really always to create a video see-through <clears throat> mixed reality product where you know, you, you had this sort of seamless experience. Um, before we could tackle that, we needed to 
make a human eye resolution virtual reality headset um, and, you know, tackle some of the limitations that users and researchers face with consumer grade hardware. Um, so the main thing there being resolution. I mean, here in this picture, you can see on the left, a shot through the Vario XR3. Uh, on the right is a consumer grade headset. Um, and, you know, the, the picture is much blurrier. You can't really read the, the font or the dials. Um, and these consumer grade product products, because they are, you know, made in mass production and to some extent have to achieve a, a minimum viable product for larger distribution. Um, they have limitations on screen door effect, God rays, um, not as high resolution displays and lenses. So one of the first things that we wanted to tackle was making a truly enterprise level high end device. Um, so resolution was a big part of that. So, you know, obviously a distinct difference here on, on the right side, the consumer grade is, would you say that's more um, for gaming? and where the, the big difference or, dis or distinction in clarity is important when you're dealing with things like research, training, design, engineering, or things of that nature? Yeah, you know, there, there certainly are uh, use cases and places in research and, and other industries for, you know, other products. Um, but anything where you really need to create a extremely realistic, you know, digital twin or you know, you're doing it in a design or research workflow where interacting with the virtual space as you would in the real world is, you know, of utmost importance. Um, you really want to be using a, a higher resolution display. I mean, the, the Vario XR3 within it, uh, if you're looking at a virtual model, you're able to see things down to the millimeter. Um, you know, you're able to read 10 point wow. font at scale. So it, it really enables you to create this, this true one-to-one -one comparison and you don't need to, you know, enhance the scale. Um, like imagine if you were a pilot with this in front of you and you were used to the actual cockpit and you got in the virtual environment. If you're dealing with that screen on the left, you'd have to increase the size and, and the resolution. And very quickly, you're getting farther away from what that actual experience is like, which can have some negative side effects in training. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Appreciate that. So just this video or this picture can quickly show sort of the difference um, between an AR optical see-through technology that I mentioned um, versus a video see-through and, and photorealistic technology. The Vario headset image is on the right. Um, so, you know, when you're using an optical see-through technology or an, an AR technology, you do end up with you know, these sort of ghostly translucent objects, um, they can have a bit of a smaller field of view, which can break immersion. Um, and this video see-through mixed reality experience really lets you create a full human eye resolution digital twin at a, in a full field of view. Um, so it's a, a much more immersive experience. So Tim, uh, maybe you could share on, on, on that, uh, what use cases uh, would you say one versus the other? Yeah, so for the um, optical see-through technologies, I mean, there's certainly a place for, for that technology. Um, you know, it really puts the impetus on mobility. Um, you know, those devices are often wireless or can be powered by like a remote battery pack, um, which, you know, makes them great fits for if you need to go on site uh, and say, look at like an overlay of piping or schematic information, right? That's a really good fit for an optical see-through device. Um, video see-through, because you are tethered to a computer, you are using the power of the GPU. And as you can see in this video that's now playing here, um, it is combining the video feed from two 12 megapixel cameras on the front of the XR3 with the real world. So that is a, a real room that that uh, car was appearing in. Um, and you're able to create a, a full digital twin. So you know, back to that construction site example, if you were on site, you know, if you wanted to create a full digital twin of an entire building, that's an area where the video see-through XR3 is going to be a much better fit. And, you know, you can see with this video playing again, um, I've demoed this to people wearing the headset. This car comes into view. It's a 10 billion polygon count model. So it's extremely realistic. People go to lean on it. And, you know, sometimes I have to catch them. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, I had the opportunity to, to test this uh, in, in real life uh, in, in mixed reality. And I think the piece that really blew my mind was just how, how you could switch from the virtual reality to the mixed reality and back and forth uh, so simply and easily. Yeah, and it, it really is that easy. I mean, you're effectively communicating with the cameras to just have them, you know, be turned on or off. Um, and it allows for really customizable setups. I mean, depending on what the goal is, you can be in full VR, you can switch to mixed reality, you can have a, a blend of both, um, depending on, you know, what the, the real goal is. So it's very easy to use. Um, and we have a software, Vario Lab Tools, that actually enables you to do that type of thing without very much development or coding. You can basically use this software, which sits on top of an engine or other program that you're running. And we'll just, you can communicate with the cameras to see through into the real world in certain areas and look at virtual content in others. So it's very easy to create um, setups like this. Very cool. All right. So uh, I would venture to say that a lot of the, uh, our, our viewers here would like to hear some more around use cases and where Vario and VR is being used, used today in schools. So maybe share some examples of that. Absolutely. So the, the first one here that we'll be able to see um, is an anatomy trainer with a company, Touch of Life Technologies. This product is actually called the VH Dissector Lab that I do a lot of work with um, collaboratively and deploying our technology and their software to different schools. What makes this use case really impressive is they have a super high fidelity model of a human cadaver. Um, it's a little bit gruesome, but this data is real patient data from the Visible Human Project and was actually sliced every millimeter and then imaged. Um, so the, the result is a fully annotatable, fully dissectable, super high data set um, of the of human anatomy. And as you can see, you can um, you know, perform cross sections being seen here. You can select different anatomy and dissect it. Um, and this is happening in mis mixed reality. So that is a real room, it's a real lab. A teacher can be talking to a student as they do this and be signed on to the same session on a computer or a different piece of hardware. So it's very collaborative. You can even add instruction-based dissections for stiff, different parts of anatomy. Um, so it's a, a really great piece of learning software that fits really well with the strengths and weaknesses or the strengths of our headset in terms of having super high resolution um, and this interactive sort of advancement that you get by having a mixed reality device. Um, another benefit is since it is virtual, it's not nearly as smelly and it's actually a lot cheaper than a real body as well. Yeah, I, I would venture to say uh, that would be the case. I, I was gonna ask you, you know, what, what are the advantages of this versus the real cadaver? Um, uh, yeah, obviously the smell would probably be the biggest one. Um, so yeah. in terms of the schools or departments that use this, I mean, you know, obviously I would think biology, med schools, nursing schools and the like, yep. or what else? A absolutely. A, a lot of uh, training hospitals as well, different med schools. Um, we've deployed this to probably 20 plus different universities now um, on the XR3 with their software. Um, and I mean, in terms of the benefits, of course, the smell. Also, you can mess up and start over, which is, you know, very different if you're working with real anatomy. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we do a lot of great work with them. Yeah, it's probably a lot easier to do a do-over in this, in this scenario than, uh, than the real life scenario. So Certainly. And <laughs> we also have, you know, started to do different work with them, even outside of universities, um, at some research projects at the Department of Veteran Affairs. So it's uh, really great to just sort of see the traction um, that you can build you know, from something like this when the software and hardware are, are such a perfect match for each other. Hmm. Insanely detailed. So moving on to something else that I wanted to highlight. Um, so here we have a, a project with 10 Star. Um, this was uh, construction and heavy machinery opera, uh, operation trainer. Um, and, you know, outside of the medical field, there are a lot of use cases in, in this area as well. Um, and some of the benefits are, are very similar. I mean, you can spend 
um, a lot less money by doing things in, in virtual reality as in terms of having access to these real machines, doing it in VR is a lot less expensive. Similar, you know, by doing training like this, you get more repetitions, fewer accidents, um, and you get to practice real world scenarios that could actually be dangerous in a safe environment. Um, so, you know, that's a, a huge benefit of sort of transitioning to VR for training as well. So again, similar to the cadaver, you can, you can make a mistake and you don't destroy a large piece of equipment or what have you. Um, what, I mean, that's stark contrast to the medical field though, obviously. So what, what schools or programs, um, would you say would utilize this particular scenario? Yeah, so you know, there's a lot of work being done in vocational schools, technical institutes um, to, to better equip people entering the workforce. Also schools that focus on forestry and even you know, engineering departments um, that have a focus on you know, manufacturing and, and the practicalities related to that um, will build simulations like this. And you know, the, the people who ran this study actually called out you know, the, the main reason they used Vario hardware for, for this particular use case um, was one, you know, when you're putting lots of students through a simulation, you want to mitigate simulator sickness. You want to, you know, have the best outcomes. Um, and, and our headset, because it has a lot higher resolution and biconvex lenses, the simulator sickness and, you know, the sort of negative effects that people often think about being associated with VR are really mitigated. Um, and the other major call out was actually our eye tracking technology, which we haven't discussed yet. Um, but we have a proprietary eye tracking technology that is very advanced. Um, and when you put the headset on, it will actually do an automatic IPD calibration and physically move the lenses with the motor so that you get a perfect experience every time. Um, and in that 10 star use case, um, they called out that when you're training on this heavy machinery, they could go back to the sessions and if someone did make a mistake, they could see what they were looking at in that exact moment. You know, were you looking at the, the proper, were you looking in the mirror when you should be backing up? You know, were you distracted by something in the environment rather than, you know, looking where you were supposed to inside of the cab of the vehicle? Um, so, you know, the, the eye tracking explicitly was called out for this use case, which may not be immediately apparent when you think of, you know, hey, operating heavy machinery. I'm, I'm imagining, uh, you know, uh, NFL football when they go back and they, they look at the tape kind of a thing. So I can see, you know, in this scenario, go back, where were you looking or what were you thinking at that time? So you can avoid that error again in the future. Yeah, that, that's exactly that's exactly what it is. Um, you can really have a, a game film esque scenario where you can, you know, see the sort of uh, stimuli or, or the situation that maybe led to someone making a mistake. Um, and, you know, you also don't have that advantage if you're doing something outside of VR as well. Um, so we can move ahead to the next video because that also talks about eye tracking. Um, and here, what you'll see is a similar technology, the eye tracking, as we talked about on the 10 star slide, um, but instead, you know, you can imagine how this technology, besides the game film sort of analogy, can be used to just gather really important qualitative and quantitative data. Um, so we've seen a lot of business schools start to use our headsets in consumer research studies, um, you know, brand marketing studies, trying to figure out the most effective marketing strategies and sort of the benefits of different shelf placement, different colors. Um, so that's another area that, that we're starting to see and, and you can see happening in this video. I feel like I should, um, we should put up another poll to see if people are now craving coffee or tea. Yeah. When we demo this, <laughs> you know, on, on show floors, you know, if it's before 9am, you know, oftentimes the people are looking at, at the coffee and, uh, you can actually see that live. Um, this, this demo also has our hand tracking integrated. So at one point in the video, I believe it happened already, but the participant looks down at their left hand and they see the live analytics of what they're looking at. Um, so usually coffee is the dominant figure on the pie chart there. Makes sense. That would be there my go-to. <laughs> so you said, so obviously, so business schools, uh, I would assume advertising, marketing departments, 
Um, where else would we, uh, you know, obviously you showed the, the previous video in case scenario, any other scenarios where the eye tracking uh, fits into play? Yeah, well, this is, was specifically a, a demo that we created to sort of show what a lot of um, companies on the enterprise side are, are starting to do. Um, you know, uh, what we're seeing that's really great in eye tracking is a lot of university research that was being done with our headset, you know, over the last two or three years is sort of now being adopted by these larger Fortune 100, Fortune 200 companies that are starting to engage in this type of eye tracking study. And, and like you said, really look back at those sort of game films. Mm -hmm. um, the major one would be in training and simulation. Um, you know, like I said earlier, the academic market really is a, a sort of microcosm of our larger market. And eye tracking has become extremely important in pilot training. Um, you know, there, there are different kinds of softwares that we engage with where, you know, in looking at a game film or a recording of a session, you know, you can see a heat map of where someone looked, for instance, um, and, and that becomes very, very important. And you know, to see the difference between someone who has, you know, 1000 hours flying versus someone who it's their first session, you, you can really see how different that is with the eye tracking data. Yeah, and I would even say from a psychology perspective, consumer behavior uh, would be another arena. But just thinking out loud. So uh, so how do I get started? Uh, I think that's probably a, a good question people might be thinking at the moment. Tim, I, I would venture to say um, that you know anything from a basic setup to obviously, I think the, the cadaver scenario, maybe that's more of an extremely advanced scenario. Maybe you can kind of walk us through uh, the different levels. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, one thing that's really important is just getting students sort of exposure to this technology. Um, so, you know, one of the first things you can do is really just provide a space where students can interact. Um, you know, oftentimes we see libraries, you know, multidisciplinary education centers, innovation centers, there are starting to be spaces, um, you know, real spaces, buildings at different schools dedicated to, you know, being a place where technology and different departments come together. So VR is a really good fit for that. And what's great is, you know, you don't need to be incorporated specifically into a curriculum. There's a ton of content out there. Um, there are demos that Vario provides to its customers that can be really good to interact and familiarize oneself with um, versus, you know, just a lot of content available that students can engage with. Um, and, you know, while there are sort of more advanced ways to use the technology, even just providing a space to engage with VR, you know, sets students up to be more familiar with the technology. Um, you know, learning can become active rather than passive if you're engaging with an environment. And there's a ton of research that, you know, learning in VR in this kinetic, immersive way helps people understand complex concepts, you know, digest subjects and theories they may not otherwise, um, and, you know, even boost your creativity and, and improve memory. You can really sort of gamify learning. So on to sort of the next category, um, you know, but you do to sort of take VR out of uh, interactive experience like that or out of the library and, you know, sort of put it into a classroom or into a curriculum. Um, you know, there are some easy ways to do that. Um, so, you know, Vario, since we're very hardware focused and we want to create the most advanced mixed reality and VR hardware out there, it's been really important for us to get compatible with different groups building software that is used for teaching and, and also softwares themselves that are used both by our enterprise customers um, and by different schools and, and universities. So can you share some of the different workflows that would apply here? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. So one of the main things would be um, you know, we have lots of customers in the enterprise and design manufacturing design space. Um, so the sort of CAD software arena is, is quite large and vast, but a lot of our important enterprise customers use our headsets for design all the way down to prototyping um, to design reviews. So we've gotten compatible with 
all the softwares that are used in those industries. And oftentimes those same softwares are used in, in university curriculums. Um, you know, schools will often train students on the same software workflows that they're going to be hired for um, and the, the skills that they're going to need that employers are going to look for on a resume um, in a, you know, enterprise commercial environments. And what's great now is they can also have students using the same hardware, the same headset VR XR technology that they're going to be using in, in those companies. Um, so a lot of it is in manufacturing and, and design, but also just familiarizing students with immersive tech. You know, it's becoming a lot more common in the medical industry as well. So we have a variety of software partners in the medical field, Touch of Life, like I mentioned earlier, um, and a few others that we can provide examples for that have built softwares with our headsets that can sit directly into different medical and training curriculums. Fantastic. So the, the best example of this and, and what's really exciting is when different research um, is sort of built around VR or built around mixed reality and it hinges on something that the technology enables a researcher or professor to do that they wouldn't be able to accomplish with any other technology. Um, and you know this does require you know, a, a bit more of a familiarity and is a, a good thing to shoot for. I mean, oftentimes you do need developers who are familiar with um, Unreal Engine or Unity softwares that these experiences are built out to. You know, you need the, the proper hardware um, and, you know, a, a professor and student team that's, that's really working to create this and, and run this research. Um, you know, the, the upside is that since Vario is enterprise and research focused um, and, you know, is, is really focused on that customer group, um, we have really good support and are able to interact with researchers and, you know, set up calls with engineers, really tailor the experience so that you can accomplish your goals um, in a way that other companies in this space are not. But if you have this familiarity with the, the world and the engine and the, the tech that's involved, um, there really is limitless research possibilities. I mean, you can, um, you know, create anything that, that comes to mind, like the 10 star uh, manufacturing training, you, know, you can build something super bespoke and specific. So, you know, you use the word limitless, um, would you be kind enough to share an example uh, of, of a, an experiment that a department used uh, that you could share with the our, our viewers? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a, a lot of them. Um, you know, what, there was a, some really interesting research in, in eye tracking that went on at Virginia Tech that we did a different um, webinar about. Um, you know, we've recently had our headsets used to train and um, get insight on how people learn to fence, which was a, a really cool study. Um, so there are a ton of them out there. Um, but again, you can sort of create and tailor an experiment environment that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, like that touch of life example, you know, if you don't have access to a real cadaver, you know, you can do it in VR and it's a, it's a great technology to utilize. Mm -hmm. Lucky enough, we also have a video prepared um, that shows an uh, example like that at Loma Linda University. Um, in this project, they will explain this in the video, um, but they were able to create a first responder triage trainer, and it, it really sort of hinged on all the things that we've been talking about. Um, so we'll play this quick video now, which starts a little bit chaotically. So um, if your mic is turned up, really loud, maybe turn it down a bit if you're working from home, but this is a great video to sort of explain what we've been talking about. Oh my gosh. What's the block tag? Sir, I'm going to have you to the side so that I can but help your friend. But that's it was a big bus crash rollover with a whole bunch of mannequin dummies that were in various states of harm. During our critical event response week, we have our students from all across the university come together and practice a triage simulation. We put them in through a mixed reality or augmented reality simulation in which they're wearing glasses and we drop them into an environment that's just up here in our local mountains. And the scene is that a bus has 
foot down the ravine and they're responsible for triaging a massive number of patients. There's two learners or players in the scene at any one time, uh, plus the bus driver who adds a little bit of chaos and commotion to it as well. They are supposed to work together to be able to triage all the patients. The students were all given triage tags and in a disaster, their role is to quickly triage each of the patients they encounter so that we know which patients are the most critical. If you're a kid and you're above 30 but below 45 and everything else is okay, what does that make you? Great. Great, right? At the end of the mixed reality session, we do a debriefing to hit the salient points and making sure that they are understanding what we want them to get out of the experience. It's very convincing and it kind of makes you feel like you're actually in the situation. I could hear just like the tenseness of the scene. I could hear the baby crying in the background. <laughs> Simulations like this are really important because if you haven't ever seen it before, if you haven't practiced, if it happens in real life, you're not going to know what to do or how to respond. Now I have a little bit of understanding what it might be like to walk through a situation like that, triaging patients, who's dead, who needs to get seen right away, who can wait a little bit. Very well done. One of the best simulations that I've had uh, throughout medical school. It's our hope that with this experience, the students have what they're supposed to learn hardwired into their memory. So that in the future, when they come across patients of all walks of life, they're able to take this knowledge and apply it to be able to care for the people in front of them. Amazing. Well, thank you, Tim and David. Um, let's dive into some questions. Now that we've had an opportunity to really talk about how virtual and mixed reality are being used in higher education and dive into use cases and how to get started, let's, let's answer questions from you. Um, if you have anything that is top of mind that you want us to talk a little bit more about, please drop it into the Q&A, um, little Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom panel. We have a couple to start. So Tim, David, you ready? Yeah, let's dive sure. in. Sure. All right. Um, can you comment on how many universities are utilizing Vario for education? Yeah, so I, I can't give a specific number, um, but I will say, you know, while of course universities are, you know, perhaps not purchasing in, um, you know, huge, large numbers like the Department of Defense or the military might be purchasing, um, it probably is our largest market by volume in, in the U.S. Um, you know, we there are probably, you know, there are over hundreds at this point. Um, and, you know, really, we think that there's room for at least one Vario headset at every school in the U.S. So I think that number will continue to grow. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Next question. Um, and please keep them coming. If you haven't put anything in there, highly encourage you to drop something in. We have we have our two two experts ready to answer. Can you discuss the UltraLeap integration a bit further? Yeah, so we we are integrated with uh, UltraLeap's Fifth Gemini hand tracking, um, and I, I believe that there is information online in our developer portal um, about how to you know develop something specific with that if if there are questions. Um, but we do have hand tracking integrated into the Vario VR three and the Vario XR three. Excellent, thank you. There's a question around recommended curriculum. Um, I know that, you know, obviously we've covered today where we've seen Vario implemented at different schools, different curriculum. Um, but Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what curriculums make sense and perhaps what curriculums don't necessarily make sense for Vario? Yeah. And, and you know, this is an area that it's it's really important to talk about because we are, you know, a, a hardware company. So we're not creating learning software or, you know, we're not building specific curriculums in VR, um, which sometimes is something that schools are, are looking for. That's why with our, our use cases within universities, um, when we mentioned uh, the, the software partners um, and in touch of life technologies, there are a few other groups that we've partnered with or had integrations with their software that can sort of deploy or sit nicely in a curriculum. Um, there's a company, Luxonic, that has built um, a radiology reading room portable in the Aero. Um, there's a group, Nanome, that we're integrated with. And, and there's a, a large selection of others. But sometimes our software partners 
uh, and what they've built with our headsets in mind can sort of fit nicely into a curriculum. And if that's not the case, um, that's when we look for these softwares that we're compatible with on the enterprise side and, and how those might be adopted. Um, I see this question from Christian uh, at, at SCAD and um, you know, a lot of schools are using or designing in Unity or Unreal or other CAD software. So while we may not have a specific software built out, um, oftentimes the headsets fit into curriculums that use softwares that we're compatible with, uh, if, if that draws the distinction. Um, and Christian, I think I might be talking to one of your professors, so hopefully we'll get you some headsets soon. How do you position Vario products versus uh, Meta's products? Yeah, so it's it's actually, you know, we do a lot of work with Meta behind the scenes on, you know, some collaboration on, on software sides and standards and things like that. Um, you know, we don't really see ourselves as competitors. The, the technology is so different, um, you know, in terms of the strengths and weaknesses, again, sort of putting... Uh, the impetus on on mobility versus, you know, what you're able to do with a, a higher level system. Um, you know, a lot of different universities will have a, a sort of full collection of hardware, maybe starting at um, some headsets from other manufacturers that can be checked out by students. And, you know, there's some content that's a better fit for those technologies. Um, but really a lot of the high level research, uh, you know, that we see is often utilizing our headsets. Um, and if anything, now that the Quest Pro with video uh, see-through technology is out, you know, we get more requests for the XR3 because people got a bit familiar with that technology and you know, want something that can push it to the next level. Great, thank you so much. Um, do you have any samples of work in live action video versus avatars? And I asked a couple follow-up questions, but um, meaning, not showing an avatar, just live action video that plays on the headset, sales training, skills, education, et cetera. Yeah. So this is an area that we're starting to get some interest in if, if I can, uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, but uh, especially in the medical field and medical device companies, large manufacturing um, equipment, you know, large pieces of technology that uh, a lot of companies, once they deploy to their customers, they have to send someone, um, you know, pay for a flight, send an expert to train people, and they may have to ship that full piece of large technology, which can get super expensive. Um, so we're starting to see interest in creating sales training and skills education and sort of gamifying that into um, a software that, you know, would rely on the XR3. Think about putting the XR3 on seeing in a room, you know, a huge MRI machine and then having instructions on how sales training on how to engage with that product or how to use that product um, and have that be a mixed reality experience. So, you know, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, we're starting to see some momentum in that area uh, as well. And even though you didn't ask about avatars, there's some really interesting um, metahuman work with Unreal and, and different avatars as well. How would you recommend getting a VR program started for a science or STEM related curriculum? We currently don't have a program. We'd like to explore it, but getting started feels daunting. Yeah, and it, it definitely it definitely can be daunting. Um, so un understood there, um, you know, depending on, um, you know, what, what you're trying to do, a, a lot of uh, professors that I talk to, you know, they sometimes there are workflows that they have that are 2D currently, whether it's, um, you know, looking at biological structures or proteins or things like that. And a lot of the same file types that these softwares use um, are, are the same file types that, you know, developers use in Unity and Unreal and different game engines. So sometimes there is, you know, really low development or work needed to just get images that you're viewing and teaching with into a format that can be viewed collaboratively and viewed in mixed reality or VR. Um, so, so that's an area that, you know, can actually be potentially less complicated than, than you would think. And there's a lot of value on just looking at an object in 3D versus 2D. Um, and, you know, again, there are some softwares that we're compatible with as well that you know may fit some of the things that you're trying to do. 
And, and Tim, if I could add on to that uh, as well is, you know, it's not something that you have to do alone when you're starting a program. You know, the benefit that everyone here has is that you've got resources, uh, resources within Vario and resources as well within Adorama. So we can understand what you're looking to do, what your thoughts are, understand potential budgeting and, and come up with some options to help you get started and then you know, grow the program down the line as well. So use your resources. Can you provide any insight into how universities deploy and manage multiple headsets from a device management standpoint? So since our headsets um, are tethered and, and connected to a computer, there are some uh, like device management softwares that, that we're compatible with, but we actually, um, you know, since we're hooked up to that computer, oftentimes it's not super needed um, because you're really controlling the content on the headset from the computer that it's attached to. Um, so, you know, that that's a way that you actually have a little bit more control. I mean, anything that you're doing, on the computer or content that you're creating. It's not being downloaded from um, you know, a, a third party store from a, a company or, or something like that. So um, there's a, a bit more control. I see a question about haptics that I can uh, jump into. Um, so we, we are compatible with uh, some different haptics experiences, um, but one thing that that is is really great about mixed reality is we actually see a lot of people building in a way that you're utilizing your real hands. Um, so I think haptics is a, a really interesting industry, and there are certainly you know some places where it makes sense, um, but it is you know sort of an uh, emerging technology. Um, and what's great about Vario and the ultraly pan tracking integration is you can see your real hands in a mixed reality environment um, and. You know, it will occlude virtual content. So some of these research experiments are set up in a way that you're actually using your real hand and getting real feedback. Um, think about that Loma Linda video and interacting with the mannequin and actually performing the triage, but having everything around you be virtual. Um, so yes, we are comp compatible with haptics, but because we have hand tracking as well, um, sometimes it's a lot easier and actually more analogous to what it would be like in the real world if you are using your hands as haptics. Okay, next question. Can you elaborate on your experience with usability and design when working on your projects? What are some things to consider when developing learning experiences? How could Vario eye tracking come into play? Um, are there any materials available to a developer? Yeah, so definitely check out our developer website. Um, we have uh, very specific information on the Unity SDK, the Unreal SDK, um, the compatibility with OpenXR and OpenVR. Um, so it's developer.vario.com and we can you know, make sure that information gets sent out after, but most of what you need is on that website. I see a question about how many um, environments being available. Um, or is it common to develop a targeted environment? Um, a lot of these research groups will build something custom. Um, and as I said, we have guidelines around how to do that. Um, we do have some pre-made Vario demos that you're welcome to use. And, and some groups do use those technologies and then perform you know, eye tracking studies and, and things like that. Um, and that can be a great sort of entry level using content that we've built out. Um, but a lot of people will build their own environments or what's great is you probably have something again that you can use that you wouldn't have to build new. Um, you know, if students have work that they've built in Unity or Unreal or in Autodesk products, one of the easiest ways to start using our headset is to just look at student work that is already exists, um, you know, parts of the curriculum, design curriculum that already exist and look at those in uh, mixed reality. Um, do you have any resources or processes to facilitate the introduction of VR to individuals who suddenly find VR training as a requirement for their job? So I'm almost thinking of that as um, potentially students that are graduating from a particular school, if that VR type of training is needed for them to actually use in the workforce. Yeah, I mean, depending on the the kind of training, like it would be good to have a, you know, maybe a, a, we can reach out to you directly. Um, 
And, you know, there are, are probably different kinds of training, like, like we mentioned that, you know, we'll sort of lean on um, technologies that may exist in, in our headset versus others, like doing that mixed reality is a major one. Um, so that, that would be good to, to hear a little bit more about and follow up, I think. Um, one here is a question about the eye tracking. Um, so our eye tracking is integrated directly with the headsets and is proprietary. Um, so you do need access to our headset to develop with it. Um, and so that there's the answer there. Um, a, a great question that from an anonymous attendee that I see is a good transition here in a second. Um, there was one more that I saw that I, I wanted to answer. Um, oh, from John. Um, so with the high resolution, can the headset be used to replace the office workplace? Um, so if you use the XR3, um, since it is sort of replicating what it's being seen on the computer, you're not able to have multiple screens. Um, you are able to essentially have a limitlessly sized version of whatever you're seeing on, on your uh, screen on the computer. Um, so there would be a super large monitor in front of you in VR, or if you're using the XR3 in mixed reality. So we actually do see uh, some people using headsets like that for working. Um, and because the eye tracking is getting that really precise IPD adjustments, um, and it's, it's pretty comfortable with the strapping technology, um, you can wear it for, you know, four or five hours straight. Um, it, it seems like a really long time. And, you know, I wouldn't want to be in a consumer grade headset nearly that long. Um, but our developers, you know, really sit in these things all day and, and don't take them off. Um, and that's, you know, how good the video see-through mixed reality is. It's less than 20 milliseconds. Um, so it really tricks your brain into thinking that you're seeing the real world around you real time and not through a camera. Um, and a really extreme example of that is they actually drove with the headsets on at a project that Volvo was doing, um, literally driving through the cameras. Um, so if it's you know good enough to do that, it's good enough to work in for a few hours and you know look down at your keyboard. Highly encourage everyone to check out a lot of the collateral we have listed on our website under case studies on our standard blog and our Vario Lab blog. Um, we just recently posted. Um, a use case where someone kind of extended the use or the extended the, the wear time of an XR3 because it really was designed to be able to wear for much longer periods of time than consumer focused headsets, knowing that you are going to be utilizing it to, you know, to, to perform, to perform a particular role or, you know, your, your work, et cetera. Um, and one last one that I can jump in and, and answer um, is the question about the, the headset being a bit heavier. Um, because it, it is a bit heavier than, you know, some, some others on the market. Um, the, one of the main reasons for that is it does have two displays per eye. Um, it has a, a 35 pixel per degree, the XR3 has a, a 35 pixel per degree LCD display and then has a micro OLED display. Um, and when those are overlaid, that's where you get a super high resolution area in the center of the screen. Um, and then additionally to that, with the eye tracking, there is an actual motor that's going to move the lenses. So that ends up having a bit more weight as well. But because of the strapping technology that we have with the sort of strap coming over the top, you can actually see behind me on my background. Um, it really takes the weight off of the forehead and distributes it. So while the actual weight is a tad heavier, um, it doesn't feel like that when you wear it. And, you know, that's why you're able to wear these things for pretty long sessions is it's actually quite comfortable once you get it dialed in. Excellent. Tim, let's let's lead into some exciting things. Yeah. So one of the, the questions that was in there was um, about discounts for educational institutions. Um, we are running an academic discount program um, for our university partners. So if this has you interested or, you know, you work with anyone else at your university or, you know, think anyone be, would be interested, please reach out. Um, you know, we will, you know, help facilitate a conversation with either myself or the team for Adorama, potentially both of us. Um, and it's, you know, really exciting around this time of year to sort of coincide with the end of the fiscal year. We have some aggressive discounts across all of our hardware for EDU customers. 
So hopefully at this point, gears are turning, whether or not you have virtual or mixed reality in, you know, in, in your college or university now, um, or, you know, you, you potentially do when you want to, you know, your gears are turning in terms of how to expand it. Um, we really appreciate you joining us over the last hour. Varial will be following up with a recording from today, and we'll also have contact information like is listed on this slide here. David, do you want to share a few thoughts from that or Emma side? Absolutely, Karis. Yes. Uh, so this was great. Uh, thank you, Karis. Thank you, Tim and the Vario team. Um, I, I, you said it, you know, hopefully gears are spinning. Um, you know, there's a lot of different angles and ways to uh, come about this. So hopefully we got everybody thinking. And again, as you can see, uh, we are working in tandem and partnership, Vario and Adorama. So hopefully uh, this leads to conversations. So you can reach out. There's the email on the address, edu at adorama.com. We have dedicated account managers that are assigned to all the universities throughout the country and schools. So uh, we will get you to the right person to start that conversation uh, with our technical specialist and certainly with the team from Vario. Uh, so we can help you, as we like to say uh, here at Adorama, master your mission. Uh, but this was great. Thank you so much. Really informative. Amazing. Thank you. So obviously on behalf of myself, Tim, the Vario team, David and Adorama Business Solutions, thank you so much for your time and we look forward to connecting.